for those of you who don't know me, and I'm sure there are very few who don't, but let me still introduce myself. I'm Karen Pastricha with at the Ananta Aspen Center. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to see so many good senior colleagues and friends here today. Um, the Aspen Institute, which got renamed the Ananta Aspen Center just a few months ago, uh, focuses on three specific areas. Uh, which is foreign policy, domestic policy, and leadership development. This is part of our foreign policy programs, and uh, we're very, very proud to have uh, two eminent speakers. Uh, very briefly, Ambassador Sood served, he's got a long history in disarmament, so we couldn't have got a better speaker than him. Uh, he served as Director of Disarmament and set up the Disarmament and International Security Affairs Division, which he uh, led till and then as Joint Secretary in the Foreign Ministry. Um, he then um, was India's first ambassador, permanent representative to the Conference on Disarmament at the United Nations in Geneva from 2001 to 2004. Subsequently, he served as ambassador to Afghanistan and then amb ambassador to Nepal, ambassador to France, and now, of course, Peace. We, of course, have a very long-standing relationship with Raja because he's been a very regular participant to the Track 2 dialogues that we run, and uh, we've been very honored to have him as part of many of our dialogues around the world. With these brief words, over to you, Raja. Thank you so much again for being with us. Thank you, Kiran. Uh, let me join Kiran in welcoming all of you for this uh, afternoon's discussion on um, nuclear India, retrospect and prospect. Uh, Kiran said there are two speakers, actually. Uh, there is only one speaker, uh, that is Ambassador Sood. I'm sure all of you have come to uh, hear from him because he's now the Special Envoy of the Prime Minister on uh, nuclear issues. So my job is to really, as a sutradhar, as we say, just to uh, keep the show moving rather than uh, intervene in any substantive sense. So I think we're going to start, uh, uh, once I just give a few remarks, then uh, Ambassador Sood is going to speak. And after that, uh, we'll have a you know, kind of a discussion between ourselves, and then we'll open up the, uh, the, it for the uh, questions and answers from the, from the floor. Uh, let me just say uh, three things uh, at the outset, I mean, which is uh, when we talk about the nuclear issues, uh, essentially uh, it has three facets uh, that, that come into play. Uh, one is the question of uh, how does India use nuclear technology uh, in broader terms for peaceful purposes, and more particularly for uh, generating uh, nuclear electricity in India. Uh, it's an old program. Probably India was the first country in Asia to launch a nuclear reactor. But for a variety of reasons, of course, since then, uh, we've fallen behind, and a whole range of factors uh, exist for that. Uh, the second set of issues is in relation to nuclear weapons. Uh, that what should be and what is uh, India's attitude towards nuclear weapons. Uh, the questions about morality, the questions about security, uh, have long been part of the great debate on India. Uh, what should India do uh, with nuclear weapons? A, a third aspect uh, is the uh, question of international regulation of both nuclear energy, uh, of arms control. Uh, what is the international mechanism uh, to, to regulate uh, the development of nuclear weapons? And uh, how do you separate the civilian and the military uses of nuclear energy. That is the issues relating to proliferation. So and these three sets of issues, of course, they're not uh, each one uh, completely on its own. Uh, there's deep interconnection between the three of them. And for India's own policy, uh, which India's nuclear program began before independence, and these three sets of issues have constantly uh, impinged on uh, India's engagement with the world, uh, created complications, and much of the the struggle, I think, uh, has been 
uh, how do you find a harmonious way out where India can develop uh, uh, nuclear energy for electricity? Uh, how can it have nuclear weapons uh, for ensure our security? And how does it relate to the global institutions? And how does it participate and contribute to the uh, management of uh, global issues? And I think uh, Ambassador Sudh is well placed to talk about these issues because he was involved at a very critical stage uh, in the early 1990s uh, when there was enormous pressure on India uh, to, uh, to roll back its nuclear program. And then uh, he was involved with uh, the decisions that went into India's nuclear testing. And after the tests, uh, managing the fallout and to uh, reconcile India's interests uh, with the rest of the world. So, Ambassador Sudh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me first of all thank Kiran and the Ananta Center for inviting me to speak to such a distinguished audience this afternoon on a subject which has, which is assuming greater topicality. I'd also like to thank Dr. Rajanahan for his uh, generous introduction. Structures the talk into two convenient parts, retrospect and prospect. I would divide retrospect into three distinct phases, 1947 to 74, 74 to 98, and 98 to 2008. And propose that post-2008, and we can see as the beginning of the prospect, a phase which in my view is still unfolding and whose achievements are yet to be harvested. Notwithstanding these distinct phases, I will also try to highlight the fact that underlying India's nuclear journey, there is an element of continuity which is reflected in what I call the three policy constituents, which is an Indian worldview a political will, and a military technical capability, which I think, as this audience well knows, is something that has to keep evolving. The first phase actually began even before independence, when Dr. Homi Baba wrote to Sir Devarji Tata, drawing attention to the enormous potential of nuclear technology and suggesting the setting up of what became the TIFR. After independence, things moved very quickly. Establishment of the Atomic Energy Commission in 1948, the commissioning of the first research reactor, Apsara, in 1956, and by 1969, the Tarapur power plant was online. It was an optimistic period, marked by the sentiment behind Atoms for Peace and the establishment of the International Atomic Energy Agency with the idea of promoting international cooperation for peaceful applications of nuclear technology. India spelt out its three-stage program with the closed fuel cycle, which remains incidentally an integral part of DC's mandate even today. This was also the phase when India took a number of initiatives, initiatives to curb nuclear testing, the spread of nuclear weapons, and the like. However, during the series, particularly after the India-China War in 62 and the Chinese nuclear test in 1964, there was a think. The nuclear had entered our security calculus for the first time. And in the resolution at the AICC session in Durgapur in 1965, our failure to obtain security guarantees from US, USSR, France, and UK, and the rejection of the NPT in 1969, therein lay the seeds of the nuclear option. The 1974 PNE demonstrated Indian capability, but it also attracted considerable international criticism. establishment was now deprived of international cooperation and forced to rely on indigenization. Self-reliance became the new mantra, leading to inevitable delays. NSG, the nuclear suppliers group, was set up. Meanwhile, during the 1980s, we saw the international community 
turn a blind eye to Pakistan's nuclear weaponization and missile capability with its attendant implications for our security environment. The end of the Cold War generated optimism about prospects for nuclear disarmament, but this was short-lived. The strong focus now was on tackling proliferation threats, leading to further expansion of export control regimes, which now covered dual-use goods and technologies. The indefinite and unconditional extension of the NPT in 1995 was another indicator that the salience of nuclear weapons was not going to come down anytime soon. CTBT negotiations yielded an outcome which fell far short of expectations in being neither comprehensive nor a ban. There were growing concerns that the nuclear option, which had been safeguarded since 1974, could well cease to be a credible option and maybe wither on the wind. The third phase began with the nuclear tests in mid-1998, when India declared itself a nuclear weapon state. Initially, the international reaction was strong in terms of UN Security Council sanctions. However, with sustained diplomatic efforts and changes in the international environment, particularly the realization of the threat of global terrorism after 9-11, we were able to come out of the isolation phase. The circulation of the draft doctrine in 1999 was an unusually open step for the country whose nuclear program had been largely kept under wraps. Despite changes of government, this has stood the test of time, except for a few small changes. And meanwhile, India was now able to undertake a new set of security dialogues with its strategic partners and also engage in CBM negotiations with both China and Pakistan. Through these turning points, there has been a degree of continuity, an intertwining of the strands of moral politique and real politique, a conviction that the three-stage nuclear power program was essential and despite delays, needed to be assiduously pursued, and a determination that India would not be subjected to nuclear threats or coercion. Coupled with the unique restraint lasting nearly a quarter century between demonstration of capability in 1974 and declaration of India as a nuclear weapon state in 1998 was also the conviction that a nuclear weapon free world is a desirable objective because it enhances India's security and also global security. Now this is a stand which again has been consistently maintained since independence and is also reflected in the nuclear doctrine. Let me now turn to the second part of the title, namely prospects for nuclear India. I would suggest that the India-US Civil Nuclear Cooperation Agreement of 2008, also called the 123 Agreement, marks the beginning of this period. Since then, a number of bilateral cooperation agreements have been signed, some with regard to supply of reactor fuel and others for setting up nuclear power plants. India has also adopted the Nuclear Liability Act, though this is a subject on which nuclear technology suppliers still have some questions which will need to be addressed. Gradually, India has overcome the barriers that isolated it from international nuclear trade and commerce in the civilian field, though membership of export control regimes, particularly the nuclear suppliers group, still remains a work in progress. Greater transparency nuclear establishment has come about as preliminary steps have been taken to separate the military and civilian fuel cycles by voluntarily placing some of our power reactors under IAE safeguards and regulatory and oversight mechanisms are being strengthened. All these are actually ongoing processes which need to be followed through by the new government which will take charge next month. Finally, we can today debate as to whether the turning points in our nuclear journey were most appropriate at that particular moment or whether these decisions were better taken earlier or later. Bold decisions require a combination of both external circumstances and domestic leadership. And it is these two together that constitute the inflection point or the turning point. However, the prospects for a nuclear India reflect the same underlying Indian worldview and political will that has characterized the turning points 
in the six decade long story, even as we continue to build our military technical capabilities in keeping with our doctrine. Thank you. Let us, uh, thanks, Akish, for the brief but uh, comprehensive survey of uh, uh, the India's retrospect and prospect of uh, India's nuclear program. Now, if I may start asking you, you know, the first question on the on the nuclear doctrine, doctrine for use of uh, India's nuclear weapons. Now, within almost within days after the nuclear test, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee stood in front of the parliament and essentially outlined the doctrine. It essentially, had three elements. I think one was a non-use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states. Uh, no first use of nuclear weapons uh, against other states possessing nuclear weapons. And third, that the the, the structure and character of uh, India's nuclear arsenal will be defined by the principle of uh, deterrence. Now, uh, though there have been some caveats, some additions that are made uh, uh, since uh, uh, May 1998, uh, you, you have actually today seems to be a consensus breaking down in the country. Now, you had the Prime Minister speak uh, other day at the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, uh, emphasizing once again the importance of no first use and, in fact, calling for an international framework to negotiate it. Uh, within days, we had the BJP manifesto, uh, which said they want to take a fresh look uh, at the doctrine of uh, no first use. Uh, they didn't say revise, but uh, they said uh, we want to review it and update it uh, because of changed circumstances. Now, given this contestation that's begun to emerge, uh, where do you see, do you see there's a case for revising of a doctrine uh, of no first use? Or do you see that once a new government comes in, I mean, I think they'll find that uh, this is the best policy uh, that India can pursue? Well, I personally do not think that there, there is a case for revising the no first use. But that's my view. But anyway, let us start with what is a nuclear doctrine? Because a nuclear doctrine, in order to be consistent, it has to be consistent both with strategy, which is overall national strategy, as well as posture. Now, we also have to look at our assets. And as I said, developing the military technical capability is something which has to continue over a period of time. We must remember that our uh, nuclear weapons program, unlike any other nuclear weapon state, actually originated out of a civilian program. We are the only country where this, is, this has been the case, whereas with all other countries, it is the reverse. The second issue that arises is, what is the role that we attribute to nuclear weapons? Is it to deter a conventional attack? Is it to deter a nuclear attack? Is it for war fighting? And so on. Now, you refer to the Prime Minister's speech, and I have a copy here. And uh, you know, the Prime Minister made two points. One was, he made it very clear. He said, uh, he talked of the role of nuclear weapons and said, more and more voices are speaking out today that the sole function of nuclear weapons, while they exist, should be to deter a nuclear attack. That's a very categorical statement. Then, of course, he, referred, he reiterated the no first use and said that if all nuclear weapon states can accept this, it can very quickly lead to a global no first use, non-use norm. And this would be the best way to delegitimize nuclear weapons. So if we look at uh, the Indian situation and we look at uh, our own doctrine, which talks of no first use, it makes it consistent with the fact that we are a defensive state. It makes it consistent with the fact that we have always maintained the role of nuclear weapons is to deter use of nuclear weapons and not for war fighting. It is consistent with the fact that we do not want to get into an arms race with any of the other nuclear weapon states. So in that sense, there is a consistency with it. Yes, we can certainly revise no first use. But then it is not just the doctrine that we will need to revise. We will need to revise postures. We will need to revise arsenals. We will need to revise our operational uh, aspects of the nuclear uh, weapon systems that we hold. 
So there is a whole range of changes that we will need to accept in order to make the doctrine, the doctrinal shift credible. The US, USSR uh, relationship, deference relationship between US and Soviet Union is perhaps the most well-documented deterrence relationship. And in fact, most of the writing has actually, that has come out of the world, has actually been on that particular deterrence relationship. And if you look at it, uh, the US began in the early 50s with massive retaliation, 1953. And then in 1954, it's already reaching to a flexible response, which then eventually became the uh, accepted doctrine for the United States. What was the principal reason behind it? The principal reason behind it was that it was felt that massive retaliation actually limited options for the United States president, particularly because the US also had a system of extended deterrence, because the US foresaw Europe as a theater of war. It, 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 there was a sense of conventional inferiority or imbalance which favored the Soviet Union. And the US had to provide the umbrella of deterrence called extended deterrence for the European allies. Now, from there, from flexible response, it led to a whole range of new developments of counterforce, countervalue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at each of the stages, you also saw a huge expansion in American arsenals and therefore also in Soviet arsenals. So, merely changing one aspect of the doctrine does not carry conviction because ultimately the doctrine has to carry conviction to the opponent, to the adversary. So, and nuclear weapons, of course, it is a weapon which is different. It is not just for war fighting, and it is not just any kind of a weapon. So therefore, it has to be coupled with um, a degree of, shall I say, transparency in order to carry conviction for the adversary of the deterrence force. And it also to have a certain degree of ambiguity in order to retain the military advantage as a weapon. So it's a combination, it's a balance of both ambiguity and transparency. And that is what renders the nuclear doctrine a somewhat unique kind of a situation. It seems, I mean, I don't know what, why the BJP and the reasons for this issue, but in the public debate at least, but there seems to be two contradictory uh, impulses. I mean, one, it says that Pakistan is building tactical nuclear weapons, the Chinese are modernizing their nuclear arsenal. So the old framework of uh, a no first use or a non-use against non-nuclear states and the minimum deterrence, but this is not going to work. So the credibility of the Indian deterrent is going to be undermined by what's happening in Pakistan or what's happening in China. On the other hand, the moment the BJP has said we want to revive the doctrine, uh, everybody else, I mean, I think the same people who are saying your deterrent is not credible are now coming to us and saying, look, oh my God, uh, you guys are crazy. Uh, this is going to lead to more tension between India and Pakistan. Uh, so therefore, uh, we need to do something between India and Pakistan. So I navigated this tension. If we go back to 98, I mean, uh, there was not a person in the world who didn't want to solve the dispute, uh, which was called a nuclear flashpoint between India and Pakistan. So in a sense, uh, would bravado take us back to uh, the situation that we've navigated, or uh, that in the end, there is no reason to change the concept, which is, look, the only purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter the use of nuclear weapons by our two original Well, the first nuclear doctrine also uh, developed by the BGP government at that point in time. So, <coughs> And as I said, I think it is a perfect legitimate exercise for any government to respect the doctrine. And incidentally, when we looked at the BJP manifesto, what it said is, it actually says, study in detail India's nuclear doctrine and revise and update it to make it relevant to challenges of current. So, uh, I don't think, I think it's uh, premature to think that they will jettison no stage at least. Uh, but nonetheless, nuclear weapons, when India went in 1990 and uh, after the test itself a nuclear weapon state, the rationale for it was not merely a military or a security related rationale. 
As I said, nuclear weapons are also political weapons. So the rationale for the tests of 1998 was partly political, partly strategic, and therefore only partly military. I don't think anybody felt at that time that nuclear weapons were going to resolve all of India's security challenges. And I don't think we should look at it um, as a magic wand or as a magic weapon which is going to do that today. So as far as Pakistan is concerned, I mean Pakistan will seek to exploit the space below the nuclear threshold. And we will have to find ways and means of developing a response to it, but a response which does not cross Pakistan's nuclear red lines. I don't think that nuclear weapons is absolutely an answer for all of India's security challenges. But the test of 1998 and the declaration of India as a nuclear weapon state has a number of messages. So the outcome has to be done all of these areas, which let, let me turn to nuclear energy issues. Starting from 1970, India had to face a number of sanctions on India's nuclear program. Uh, in 1998, then a new round of sanctions. And much of our diplomatic effort post-1998, uh, how does India make recuperation uh, with the non-proliferation regime? And how can India actually end the restrictions on India's cooperation in the development of nuclear energy? And, and that was the basis on which we did the nuclear deal. Uh, with the, United States took the leadership, but it needed the support of all the major countries, had to go through the International Atomic Agency, the Nuclear Surprise Group. So much of the world was involved in the deal. So uh, what seems paradoxical or tragic uh, in terms of what's happened is, after putting in all that effort, uh, we seem to have shot ourselves in the foot by a Nuclear Liability Act. Uh, probably there was no self-denying ordinance uh, in terms of which today essentially uh, given the kind of conditions it is imposed uh, on liability, unlimited duration, unlimited value uh, on the, not only the suppliers, but the component suppliers. Now, that has made it difficult even to get one single reactor construction started. Now, it's almost seven, seven years since the nuclear deal was finalized in 2008. So, where does this leave us in terms of, look, uh, how much Rajputka, whatever, Talwan, and probably Parliament is in the business of legislation. Passed a bad law, have to be changed. Uh, but the fact is, I'm going to say that Indian private sector, international private, private capital, or the Russian state companies cannot participate because of the nature of the liability. Uh, do you see a possibility for a re revisiting the question? Because having done all this, not to actually we get getting uranium, that's fine, the DAE can become indigenous reactors. But if we want a serious, substantive nuclear power generation program, then the question of liability will be readdressed, I believe. Yes. Um, we have to move forward with the three-stage nuclear power program. And what we foresee is that we need to move from something like 8 gigawatts of about 4,000 of nuclear power generation capacity that we have today to something like about uh, 30,000 in 10 years or so. This requires that we put on stream not just uh, the indigenous that we are planning, 100 megawatt users, but also the pollution. A word about the liability. Now, liability is actually a relatively and the first liability is the U.S. liability law. The and the come up in the manner in because the U.S. and the private sector, which was involved with nuclear power, and the U.S. nuclear power wanted to export nuclear power to Europe. So protect this. 
four in supply and liability. And of the Price Anderson Act. The Price Anderson Act also had a couple of more aspects to it, which that have a fund which suppliers contributed and the government contributed in the damage for over what is currently 1500 cars. If the actual damages were going to be over above, there was this fund in which, to which recourse could be made. I think all this, I mean, from there, 1950, we saw the OEC and then we saw the scene shifted to, we saw the IAEA uh, developing its legislation. And all of the laws were uniform in terms of seeing liability of the operator and not supplier. However, you know, liability which has been drawn in liability, it may not be entirely with international practice, but I would venture to suggest that it is an idea which is consistent with the spirit. I'll give you an example. In Fukushima, Fukushima, our case by the you know, Japan obviously goes to the international mobility. Means it is the operator who has and the supplier. to prove the point that this spirit of the now five two is Is that the thing consistent at times? Then I would add your supplier liability cannot be, nor can it be ambiguous. It has to be able to capture, has to be able to quantify this liability and be able to take out against this liability into his cost structures. So what we need to do is need to be able to sit down, uh, look at the legislation, look at the notes that have been issued to the Nuclear Liability Act and see how how moving away necessarily from the liability. Find ways so that address legitimate concerns of the community because let's the international community of suppliers, French companies or companies or Russian companies. We as we move along this path, we will also have in larger and we who will also have similar address their concerns as much as international suppliers. And so there which we will need to deal with. I think the paradox will be that uh, India put all this effort. It won't be a new factor. The Chinese have, have signed on and it's entirely uh, construction that, that the Chinese got reactive in the next five years. So I hope the next government there is anything that it wants to review, uh, it review the liability act to read some kind of a consensus uh, the new government, uh, after the elections. I had just one set of one more question, I think uh, that is on the third aspect of uh, its relationship to the international. Uh, the trade union leader doing politics, everybody should have got nuclear weapons, even though I don't know how many, but, but we seem to believe in it. That whole emphasis uh, of elimination of nuclear weapons, I'm not questioning the moral judgment there, but the more important question, we have a system. And I think that is a 
with the nuclear deal was look, India contributed to the management of the global nuclear order. And so long as the, India lifted, understanding. And I think while many of the restrictions on the cooperation, there are some that are, that is, India is not today for uh, nuclear supplies, uh, Australia, or the CR, etc. And President Obama, in Turkey, in uh, November, uh, it was agreed that, look, they work in a member of the, that, that will come as honorable, full membership of the global nuclear order. Of the plane, and what is the last few years where we, in terms of getting a membership of these regimes? You know, if we look back to what our position is in these export control regimes like the nuclear supply group, then reaction to it was a negative reaction because many of these were targeting India. The nuclear supply was a reaction to many. announced in 1980 the integrated guidance program in India and in 1980 the NTCR. You, you remember that uh, GLAP from where we were originally supposed to get the cryogenic uh, that was the deal which was signed in the So, and obviously our export control regimes, particularly Expanded to cover dual use technologies and uh, reaction. After 1998, we recalibrated a whole set of relationships. We also recalibrated our view on some of these export control regimes. And I think the objective at that time was to be able to as a responsible nuclear weapon state. So we brought into place export control systems and we it. So from there, we have moved pretty quickly to say that we want to be members of these export regimes. In the last four years, what we have seen is a fair amount of activity with each one of these you know, nuclear suppliers group with MTC in our arrangement and Australia group. Now, but as I mentioned in my this phase of the prospect of nuclear India, and this is still a work in progress, and we need to be able to push the membership, we need to be able to push through and address the nuclear liability issues, and uh, we need to be able to take this forward. We have to harvest, you know, the gains of the prospects for nuclear India. I think uh, I've spoken enough, and uh, I got already. Let's start with Professor Muni. Uh, for yourself, sir, for the recording. Brief, I say, one small observation and a question. The observation is regarding no first use. I remember a year or a year and a half of the declaration of nuclear doctrine. Uh, Sri Rajesh Mishra gave a public statement in which he said we will not and that led to a very energetic debate in India, uh, whether it, it's a caveat or it to revising the nuclear doctrine or, or whatever else it is. I wonder if you would like to reflect on it, because if caveat is relevant, you don't really need ambiguity uh, in, in the nuclear doctrine. Uh, my second question is, uh, comment on the status of Indian deterrent against Pakistan and China. Why I say that? Because you just mentioned that we are having a lot of CBMs both with Pakistan and China. Pakistan we are aware of. China we are under confusion. If this is as a credible nuclear weapon state and wants to talk to us on those issues. Well, first of all, uh, I mean, I have, I work Jesh Mishra, uh, and uh, I'm not aware of statement because, but I would say the draft new nuclear which was uh, unveiled in August of 1999, and then subsequently 
2003 January, you know, after this uh, review and the release that was uh, put out. Now, both the adoption in 1999, the new first and non use against non nuclear states was, it was spelled out. And in 2003, it was again reiterated. So I don't think there is any um, room for ambiguity in that sense. I think no first use has been. I think that, you know, uh, I don't know the circumstances under which uh, he made this. Perhaps he was trying to elicit public reaction to something like this or whatever it was. But I think as far as the stated doctrine is concerned, the no first use remains uh, an article of faith. And it has been sustained over uh, by successive governments, not just the BJP, not just the NDA government, but also the UK government. So I don't think I would question it or I would say it has been questioned in that sense. Now, we've seen what the BJP manifesto says, but I would not jump to any conclusions at this stage to conclude from the fact that the BJP revise and um, revise the doctrine. I would not sort of jump to a conclusion as to in what direction they will revise it or not. Um, regarding the, see, this whole business of acceptance by China, acceptance by a country, is something that I have never been able to understand. Does the U.S. accept a nuclear weapon state? Does the U.K. accept us as a nuclear weapon state? I mean, I think that is the way, I, I don't think we are looking for an acceptance in that sense. The point I was making was that we have, uh, after the nuclear test of 1998, what happened was that earlier, for example, we used to talk of nuclear capability. Because what we had, the jargon that we used was nuclear and safeguarding the nuclear option. I think we found over a period of time that that jargon had outlived its utility, its political utility, its military utility. So therefore, after the nuclear weapon test of 1998, we were able to engage with the world, whether it was with the, in our strategic dialogues with nuclear weapon states, or with countries with whom we have CPM-related negotiations, on a much more open platform. Now, to the extent that we can move forward, on this depends on a whole host of factors. It is not just a question of acceptance or non-acceptance. Nobody is going to come and say that, oh yes, I recognize that you have nuclear weapons. And I think that, that is something that we have sought. Ambassador Shield, come check. Rakesh, I just wanted to mention uh, on the Japanese uh, thing you cited, uh, <coughs> that actually the Daichi had done lifetime in 2007. So, and the reactor was bought uh, way back, 25 years back, 30 years back. So, they don't have a case for suppliers because when they did the light, lifetime extension, GE was totally liberated. So, uh, this kind of a thing which has happened in Tokyo is of a piece with what has happened in India, where totally extenuous considerations have led to uh, this overkill on liability. And uh, that's why uh, I feel, uh, as, uh, as Raj said, that maybe uh, it, the review of this thing is the best option. Uh, you know, rather than uh, going into uh, any justification for that. And I'd li also like to mention that this entire evolution which you very succinctly traced from Price, uh, Price Anderson Act. You see, those days the tension was between state and operator. Because in France, in Russia, in China, or uh, France and Russia basically, the elect uh, nuclear power was state sector. So the tension in these negotiations in OECD or in the IAEA supplementary convention was between operator and state. Supplier was nowhere in the factor. It is our own uh, people here who introduced this thing. It is Indian genius. So uh, I feel that it was really uh, overkill. The, I too much killed the cat. Yeah. You want to say something? Well, you know, uh, but the original suppliers were American companies. So there was, I mean, the when the U.S. 
put in the Price Anderson Act in a sense liberating the suppliers from any kind of liability and then brought in similar international efforts whether in OECD or in the IAEA. There, it, it, there was a sort of, uh, shall I say, a, a convenience of interest all around which was able to drive the process. My feeling is when you look at uh, some of the writing on international nuclear law now, which is coming out, including in Europe, by the way, there is a desire in some ways to try and revisit. So a lot of countries are actually looking at the Indian legislation. Now, as I said, I, I, was, I acknowledge that, uh, you know, it does raise certain questions. There are certain legitimate uh, questions on the part of the technology suppliers community. And these questions need to be addressed because you can't have a liability law which is open and, and, and ambiguous. So that is something which will need to be addressed. But whether we will be able to completely jettison the concept of supplier liability today, I would be a little doubtful. You, you talked about genius, actually. There's a special genius of Arun Jaitley and Shushma Swaraj uh, who aligned with the CPM uh, to undercut all the hard work that went in, of course. that's. Uh, let's see what they do when they get into power, but I'll come to you, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Raj Chengapa. I don't want to go political at this time. No, it's just referring to what happened, so it's my view. Dr. Shud, Raj Chengapa, my compliments on, uh, I think, uh, both lucid, cogent, and uh, illuminating exposition of our uh, nuclear program. I have a question which is prospective, in some sense. Uh, looking at, uh, if we do revise our doctrine, and it moves, as you said, it cannot just be a statement if you withdraw no first use and go for first use if you want to. What would be the implications, both in terms of arsenal and in terms of our policy in dealing with others? Well, you know, we will have to develop, we will have to find the intellectual and ideological moorings for our doctrine ourselves. As I mentioned earlier, it is the U.S.-Soviet deterrence equation which is the one on which the maximum of writing has been done, which has been studied the maximum amount. I don't think there is any other deterrence equation which has been studied in the same sense or has been tested in the same sense or has been analyzed in the same sense. And all said and done, the U.S.-Soviet deterrence equation takes place in a certain scenario superpowers, two hegemons, Cold War, extended deterrence by the U.S., etc., etc. So if we have to move from a no first use to a first use, well then first and foremost, what kind of a first use? We will have to redefine the role of nuclear weapons. As I mentioned, I mean, when the Prime Minister said in his speech uh, very recently, the role of nuclear weapons is to deter the use of nuclear weapons against India or Indian forces. Now, if we are going to redefine the role of nuclear weapons, then we will have to then see what is the kind of an arsenal that is going to be needed to fulfill that role. Then we'll have to see what is the kind of uh, deployment posture in terms of launch on warning or first strike or first use, whatever you want to call it. And I'm very chary here of using because certain terminologies, because they come from the US-Soviet context, so when we use the term massive or when we use, um, you know, things like uh, counter force, counter value, they all belong to a particular epoch, they belong to a particular frame of reference. And that is not necessarily the frame of reference which would apply to India and its potential nuclear adversaries. So, but nonetheless, the point, the salient point I'm trying to make is that if we revisit the doctrine, it is not in order for the new doctrine to carry conviction, it has to be backed up by a whole host of other things. How we, would we bring about changes in the nuclear command authority? Would we have greater delegation? Uh, would we still need to, what kind of um, systems would we need to put into place to ensure security against accidental launch? And a whole host of other things. Because right now when you have a no first use, you can have a different set of systems 
to prevent accidental launch. But if you have a first use, then what are the systems you would need to put in place in order to prevent accidental launch? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So if we have to move in that direction, we can, but it is not just a simple exercise of revisiting a doctrine, or just, uh, it is not just a question of changing a few words here or there. I got uh, three more people on the list, uh, so please. I'm Anu Ghosh, I'm a senior advocate, Supreme Court, and a special advisor to Tata Consultancy Services. Rakesh, you divided your uh, retrospect period into three parts, and you referred to China and Dr. Baba. Significantly, this is uh, something which is important, in the year 1957, Nehru, who was a great champion of uh, nuclear disarmament, went to Denmark to meet Prime Minister Hansen. And then subsequently, in the same year, in 1957, Hansen visited India. And in between the two visits, Hansen and Nehru put Niels Bohr and Homi Bhava in close touch with each other. And the two of them drafted what was the roadmap for India's nuclear program. It wasn't a formal treaty. It was like an unwritten alliance uh, beyond treaties and protocols, which actually laid the foundations of India's nuclear program. And then you come to the prospect period after the great development as far as the United States, the Indian-American nuclear treaty, which was definitely a significant development. But come the prospect period, when the Indian foreign ministry, you know, uh, blacklists Denmark, uh, dissuades the Indian government from any further interactions in Denmark, is, isn't it very strange that when Nehru goes first and a country which comes to your help in the very outset to build up your nuclear program is very conveniently jettisoned in the uh, prospect period. You see, I'm mentioning this to today's Denmark's national day. You see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, lady, yeah, please, just identify yourself. Yeah. We'll take two together. I'm Roshan from USI. I would first like to add a comment and then ask a question. The comment is Chinese. I think they are reluctant to accept India as a nuclear state because when I had gone to China on a bilateral dialogue, they refused to comment on any nuclear issues. So as far as that is concerned, I think what he said was absolutely right. My question is, what in your view is India's response to a tactical attack? Do you think a tactical attack needs a tactical response? And if so, what response would you uh, say, whether it should be a conventional massive attack or a nuclear attack or a tactical attack? Thank you. Okay, first of all, Denmark. I mean, you know, I think the Denmark of the 50s and the Denmark of today are probably very different. And I, I'm not sure if uh, the Danish government would be very happy if we told them that in 1956, you, you, you were responsible for 1974 <laughs> because you put Niels Bohr in touch with <laughs> Pandit Nehru and uh, Dr. Baba. So I think times change and with that obviously um, situations change. So, but uh, that, that's, I would just leave it at that. I mean, I don't think we can go back and remember that because that happened, so therefore we owe them a debt of gratitude or vice versa or anything like that. The use of tactical nuclear weapons, I mean, you know, a lot is being written about it for the simple reason that we've seen uh, Pakistan's development of the Nasra and uh, things like that. I don't think it is possible to give a categorical answer to say, oh, one tactical nuclear weapon has been used and therefore what will be India's response and how severe will it be, etc., etc. And this is where I, you remember I mentioned that 1953 to 1954, they already, the U.S. already started switching from massive retaliation to flexible response. The word flexible response was automatic, had come into the U.S. nuclear vocabulary already because they realized that uh, this was constraining options. The whole point about developing your nuclear capability is to increase your options, not to limit your options. That, that would be the strategic objective. When we talk of autonomy today, what does autonomy imply? Autonomy implies that you have a multiplicity of options from which to choose from for the political leadership. 
And I think we will need to look at a whole range of issues because it is not as if a tactical nuclear weapon would just be used out of nowhere. But there would be a certain run-up to events before uh, the use of a tactical nuclear weapon. And I think it is in the course of that that you would actually, I mean, it would be the job of the intelligence, the military leadership, the diplomatic leadership, etc., to be able to present to the political leadership options, strategic options, so that there is an autonomy from which they can pick and choose, so that they can exercise that autonomy. And uh, the article of faith here is the no first use part of it. I think other than that, there is very little else. So the manner and the manner of response, the manner of reacting to a tactical nuclear weapon would be out of a series of choices, as long as we can ensure that, as long as we produce a situation where the political leadership is not left with a single choice of do or die. Uh, that would be a disservice. Uh, that would be a wrong decision. A multiplicity of options is what I would try and uh, look for. Dr. Wolf, yeah. My name is Klaus Voll. Could, in your opinion, India consider the German example of finally closing down all its nuclear reactors? And if so, why or why not? As we, you know, the Germans want yeah, to yeah. have an energy change, paradigm change. Um, well, I think Germany is at a very different stage of development uh, compared to India. And uh, our Germany has a situation where they can uh, do this over a period of time and move massively, invest massively into renewables and so on with the kind of resource base that they have. Further, their consumption is not likely to go up. Per capita consumption is not actually going up, it is going to be coming down. You know, uh, to give you an idea as to how much is the elasticity at that level, Today, um, the Indian consumption in per capita terms of uh, an energy uh, unit, let's say kilograms of oil equivalent, is 585 kilograms of oil equivalent. The global average is about 1700. That's roughly China's figure. China is very close to the global average. The US figure is somewhere at 7000. And Japan, which is as developed a country in that sense, is at a level of 4,000. So the point I'm trying to make is that with appropriate energy efficiencies and economies and civic sense, you can actually bring down per capita energy consumptions quite hugely. This is where you have mature populations and mature and energy demands have, have matured in a sense they have leveled out. You took the case, we, if you look at Japan, where 30% of their power, the nuclear power was shut down post Fukushima. They went through 30% immediate, I mean, their power generation came down by 30% straight away, overnight. Japan didn't go through massive blackouts or any such thing. They had sufficient elasticity in the process, in their power generation process, to be able to pick up the slack. And the rest they made up by discipline. And the rest they made up by conservation measures of changing simple things like changing light bulbs or mass, things like that. We are in a very different kind of a situation because A, we have a growing population. We have 25% of our population which still lacks basic access to energy. So energy poverty is actually a hindrance to economic development. And even with the so-called ambitious plans that we have for nuclear power, we are only looking at moving from something like 4.8 gigawatts to something like, um, and this is 4.8 out of 225 gigawatts of the total power generation. And we assume that, let's say, by 2030, this goes up to 1,200 or 1,300 gigawatts. Out of that, the nuclear power will still be about 70 to 80 gigawatts. So it's a very, very small fraction. But why it is needed is because as long as we don't have alternative energy resources, it is also a means of energy security and energy independence. Ambassador Nalin Suri. Would 
Long ago. No first use and the possible review of any doctrine. And, and let me ask this very, very carefully. Uh, the so called no first use assurances that are speaking, speaking to. So called no first use assurances that are so called principal perceived opponents have offered, do they apply to India? To the Chinese declare. The Chinese. And Pakistanis. Pakistan is a Pakistan, don't offer Pakistan. Pakistan has not offered a yeah. no first use. Uh, well, again, it becomes a question, do the Chinese look upon you as a nuclear weapon state? Do they look upon you as a non-nuclear weapon state? Because as far as China is concerned, they also have a non-use against non-nuclear weapon states. I don't think anybody is going to go to China and say, excuse me, were I to attack you, would you think that I'm a nuclear weapon state? So will you apply NFU to me or will you apply... The point I'm trying to make, Rakesh, is that there are no first use children does not apply to you. Because there are no first use assurance applies to non uh, to NPT states. Well, in that case, then if they look a first use, well, that is an internal debate for us. Use as to whether or not you you are an expert, so you would be the best person to launch your. Such a no, no, then you provide the answer. I think you know that we tend to get into the into the formal. Issues. My sense is India has a serious range missile that can reach the heart of China. Uh, then it doesn't matter in NPT or outside or beyond it. It is the capability that matters. And I think for two, and I think in this debate on no first use, which I think the, 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 the beach is, my sense is look, is the question create capabilities? If you have the capabilities, believe Chinese are pragmatic. If they see a large number of Indian missiles deployed, they would assume some of them will be targeted against or the Chinese. Nuclear that, nuclear I think submarines. that would get their attention. I think, similarly, I think uh, it's not what the Chinese say. I think the question is, at this point, India does not have a credible deterrent against the Chinese. The next comment would be, how do you... Yeah, okay. The challenge for us is, how do you make and build significant missile both land-based as well as submarine-based, that would convince the Chinese and others by the measure of the capabilities. I would say, for him, it's not an abstract, textual debate on no first use, testing substantive capabilities and tested capabilities. The RDO says, look, two tests in the one test done. They got the flag around them, so we all had to clap. So I think the significant size of the missile force, the range of the missile force, uh, is going to be critical uh, than uh, the abstract portions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Ranjit Rai, so I'll come. Uh, ready. Uh, just uh, two brief questions. One, I comment on the security clause. From my little I learned, the problem was the liability clause in perpetual. But by a computer or by Russian equipment, Clause for an amount of period. The liability clause can always be built into a contract. But I thought the confusion took place is because they wanted it was in perpetuity and the ambassador there is brought up very quickly. But my question is more which Raja asked, Professor. Raja asked at the beginning the you as the ambassador and the NSA are the repository of the new uh, no first use. It's a very serious subject. Common man who not understand all this, and for the basically since 1999, when we met nuclear, the first leg is we will not use first, of course. The second leg, he has talked about capability and ability, is we go to the military at least at some level and to an intellectual community that we have the capability of the second leg, which is a massive military action. Uh, that question. Uh, just a little aside, Subramanian was to say we are waiting Indian policy is ambivalence, not ambivalence, ambivalence, and we are waiting for the nuclear submarine with Truly spoken like that. was one of the five people who wrote 
person you create constituted out of the national board. The problem here is uh, credibility, lack of credibility not across in India. I talk to a lot of Pakistan, military people who know something about this, and a lot of Chinese. In their minds, there is no doubt, not the least doubt about their credibility. They, you know, <clears throat> we used to fear Chinese missiles, nuclear ship missiles in Tibet. The situation today is very different. They have their missiles. I think you should speak about these things, Mr. Su. Sure. We have our missiles, and the Chinese see these missiles. Now, I uh, observation about the nuclear doctrine. The trouble is, you see, in the BJP, when the nuclear doctrine was drafted, there was not more than three or four, more than three or four people who understood what nuclear issues are. IT understood this. Rajesh understood. I won't move. There were one or two more. That's it around. They uh, issued this uh, uh, silly question of revising first views. We had studied the doctrine of nuclear weapons. I had been dealing with it way back with Krishna Manon and others. I was a member of the National Security, uh, United Nations Disarmament for eight years when we discussed all these things. Misha had been deep into it in the United Nations and outside. We saw no alternative to this. The thing that was lacking was the third thing, the Submarine. underwater thing. That is coming around too. But without that also, the doctrine was a credible one. The credible was a credible one. You want to uh, you know, as the Sudha said, there's nothing for no first use. There were two people in the news. Mm -hmm. The manifesto is the nuclear not no first use. Is, I, I actually you please read it. Yes, that's what I'm going to say. Revise and update to make it relevant. Yes. First you people who are two, three, that you of no first use. That's why I said it is go into any direction. Yeah. Uh, but that's why I said much let a new government. Is the government's prerogative? That's uh, I will to uh, and uh, at this stage. I'm just and then we'll have to the back. Contesting the what India make a so MPs anti nuclear activists men get majority. The Germans want us to do. Yeah, I mean, okay. So, yeah. Even before.
not yet in question that we are currently in question whether with the right the more advanced was with the the funding issue what we are looking for the power generation and in you know at least said now is a strange uh, to let's say for the coal fired operation because the capital cost is very high to running cost which the capital compared to fired plant or at so that it is great possible within a certain and all are going to and we will not go anywhere in the country which so uh, the point of time may be cost is a factor but cost has to be seen not so much the high amount but cost of per unit of one that material then the fund will be sought Address the high initial price. Was a sorry, didn't address. It can. When I said that liability neither be ambiguous, open ended. I mean, that's what you were making. All time of infinite. You know your car. car has a guarantee of not let's say 20 but um, the way that it provided you go and every two years and etc etc this fellow entity to this from the working around the except good was the rocket suit for coming here sharing it very very important subject such is a very exciting pleasure a many of the self deceptions we constructed about real politics those are resolved world uh, sort to of find uh, the disposition and interestingly this was done that what was started by uh, Vajpayee government pursued by the Manmohan Singh government and of course partly uh, the oppositional politics some of that complicated in terms of the and the liability act my sense is the next government when it comes it starts to be than the previous two governments have done because a lot of the underbrush has been cleared there are issues that this new government will have to deal with i believe one i think the liability act must be reviewed because all this not to have your private sector and the participate in it. this is a great, large nuclear in the customers because everywhere around us uh, in the gulf Reactor. Fascinating to see. Uh, Down, of course, is um, start the program. You name it. And I think Turkey has just uh, bought reactor. Chinese, right? Uh, so, nuclear uh, program that that we got to do 
with this in a pragmatic arguments that we trapped us uh, in, in doing the smile uh, important. Uh, I'm not worried about anti-nuclear movement. I'm your liability bill actually has done what do. I don't no, no, I'm not don't need activists. I mean, that bad is uh, Second, I think uh, if the post finance is uh, nothing kills it if the price goes beyond the point. Second, land which is with active support position today to do anything in India. I think it's fairly complicated by what this government the present government. I think finding ways to deal with that, any mega project is going to be significant uh, problems uh, in doing it. So I think that all of us will have to deal with it. More, the nuclear scenario is changing globally. Uh, China is Pakistan is expanding its arsenal. And the US China tensions are going to produce a whole new dynamic because we've imagined this in the US framework. But the rise of Chinese in Japan about American external difference that we talk about. So there is a whole new situation beginning to emerge in the East. And then how do space development nuclear missile defense? Miss, yeah, missile defense. So the defense versus uh, the use of space asset that is going to complicate nuclear deterrence. Conventional capabilities of nuclear weapons. Very uh, technologically dynamic environment. Which the new government must do. But the political environment, the technical environment, policy environment need to be revamped. This on the nuclear front. So let me put again. Thank you, Kiran, you have any? Kiran, you want to say anything?